Hey folks, okay, so today we got a special treat for you. Um, we're gonna go over one of the nearest and dearest topics to my heart, and we might have gone over this already, I can't quite remember, but I'm feeling it strongly for today, so we're gonna we're gonna go for it like a full-on bid that's gonna be just dedicated to it. And that is Anastasia and the Ringing Cedars books. First, we're gonna bring you a little, little doodab though. Uh, this video is brought to you by Intune. <laughs> um, this is one of my favorite essential oil blends from doTERRA. It is, uh, has a bunch of good stuff and if one of my favorites is the sandalwood. So this has the West Indian sandalwood. Also patchouli, uh, frankincense, lime, lang lang, Hawaiian sandalwood also, and chamomile. This is one of my favorite blends. This is in a roll-on. So you can open it with one hand. And I always hit up the temples. So we get a little bit on the temples here. And this is like hardly anything left. I gotta get some more, but just dose that on there and then all the, anywhere where your blood comes to the surface smells incredible so if you haven't gotten your doTERRA account yet what are you waiting for go to brightlymedia.com and get it get it go get it um you can start with the home essentials kit is what i would suggest and if you have questions about it email me um through the website i think there's a contact us button anyways so let's talk about anastasia and the ringing Sears books all right so I apologize if we've gone over this already a little bit. I, we might have, I think I must have touched on it, but we have, I don't, I'm pretty sure we haven't done like a full video that's dedicated to it. And, and, and I just had so much other stuff we had to just kind of establish first before we could get to this particular topic. But this is such a crucial and key, key one. And, sorry, just try to stop moving the camera for you. Um, Okay, let's start. So, this is on the Brightly brightly Required Reading List. It's the Ringing Cedars books, and the, there's 10 books, okay? The ten, there's 10 books. And the first one is called Anastasia, and it's about a woman named Anastasia. The whole series is about, essentially about Anastasia. So, let me tell you a little bit about her. Uh, let me just check the background lighting on this, make sure it's okay, hold on. Everything is looking good. Okay, Anastasia. So, Anastasia is a woman, and she grew up in the middle of the Siberian forest, and they call it the taiga. So, a lot of people think that um, the Amazon is the largest untouched forest on the planet, but it's not. It's actually the Russian taiga. And so, Anastasia grew up in the middle of this forest, and the trees there are like redwood sized trees. If you've ever seen the redwoods, they're massive, massive trees that are many of them bigger around than a car. Some of them bigger around than, than like a small house. So, so she grew up amidst all of these cedar trees. And now let's start with cedar trees. So cedar trees are, are significant trees. Now if you build a closet out of cedar wood, it it'll keep all kinds of bugs out, right? Like you don't get any moths in there. A lot of people like, actually I grew up and I, when I was little, we had a, a cedar closet in one of, one of the houses that I lived in. One of the closets was made out of cedar wood and we would store all of our winter clothing in there and stuff like that. So also cedar is, cedar woods uh, is, is a significant uh, wood that's used for religious purpose all purposes also for like cedar cedar kind of like incense and stuff like that and also um, The the Lebanese cedar is mentioned in the Bible a number of times King Solomon is thought was thought to be one of the wisest people at the time and he built this temple out of cedar wood and very of, out of the Lebanese cedars from from Lebanon, right? And so he he had all these people go and cut down all these cedar trees and build him a temple. And they say that this, once it was fully constructed, 
a cloud formed inside of the temple. So that's kind of an interesting story. Um, also, the thing that King Solomon, like kind of <laughs> small detail, uh, King Solomon, um, better to keep the trees alive. And that's one of the uh, things that Anastasia brings through is that throughout the course of our humanity, we've kind of moved towards kind of cutting things down and taking them apart from their natural form. And what what we find is that it's not actually as powerful. It was like a big, long experiment we tried out, right, for millennia. And it turns out that it's actually better to keep plants and life alive now. So anyways, so let me tell you a little bit about Anastasia. So, so she grew up there, and so what happens in, in 1994, Make, get yourself comfortable. This is a story. So sit down, get yourself to pause, go get some tea if you need to, right? So Anastasia grew up. Uh, she was When she was a child, her parents died at a very young age. And so she grew up with her great-grandpa and her grandpa. And in 1994, a man named Vladimir Megre ends up... He's a Russian trader, and at this time, trade started opening up more and stuff like that, I think. So... He's going up this one river into the taiga, and he ends up meeting Anastasia. Actually, she, he first meets her grandparents, but on a subsequent trip, because they ask him to cut down this huge cedar tree. I guess now that I talked about it, I have to tell you about that. So, apparently, so life is constantly bringing energy into it. Like plant life, for example, we got all these plants over here. These are solar powered. They're solar powered. Okay, does that make any sense? They have they have little solar panels that utilize chlorophyll to convert electric uh, sunlight into essentially form or elect usable electricity by them. Right. So those little solar panels are operating not just during the day with the sun, but also at night with 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 uh, starlight, starlight. They're actually accumulating lots of information and energy during the night, just as during the day, right? So, um, what happens is that most plants are, you know, bringing in a certain amount of energy, and they're also re-releasing a lot of energy. Also, like usually, there's a, a balance with that. Now, for whatever reason, certain cedar trees. And this could be, this could extend to more than just cedar trees. I, you know, I don't know. Like, that's, this is, that's going to be way beyond this conversation. But for whatever reason, certain cedar trees absorb more energy than they re emit. And at one point, it reaches a critical mass. They function like a battery in that it ends up storing lots and lots of energy in its tissue, right? So at some point, it reaches a critical mass and it starts kind of like creating like a humming sound to the cedar tree and you're not gonna you're probably not gonna find much information about this type of thing online Anastasia talks about in reading cedars books the only place I've ever heard of anything like this um, so just so you know about that like you're probably not gonna go to like scientific American and be like oh yeah what do you think about that that like that's not gonna be in there I'm just telling you right now Okay, so, um, so, so for whatever reason, these cedar trees absorb more ener energy than they re-emit, and they reach a critical mass point on that energy, and it, st and it starts generating a hum, a really, really high-pitched, almost like a power line, kind of like a crackling little, kind of like, like if you go by really po high-powered crack, po high-powered power lines, you can kind of hear like that hum up there, but in this one, it's a more pure sound, more like a high-pitched bell or gong almost, right? So when Vl Vladimir goes up this river, he when he first meets Anastasia's grandparents, he they ask him to, to take this long trek into the forest, cut down one of these massive huge trees, and then cut it into little pieces and disseminate them to people around the world. <laughs> So Vladimir is like a practical trader and he's like, uh, yeah, no, yeah, no. <laughs> so, <laughs> I mean, these are like redwood, these are huge trees. You don't just walk up to one and start cutting it down, you know, it's like, 
lot of freaking work. Let's put it that way. And and so, anyways, that that's that. So he doesn't do it, but he thinks about it. And a year later, he comes back because he started doing all this research on cedar trees, and he started seeing that what is going on. And he started also finding very interesting information about cedar nuts and cedar nut oil, which at the time and still is to some level, but at the time, especially in 1994. 1993 he couldn't like all this like there's kind of like a mafia kind of vibe around the acquisition of pine nut cedar nut oil and so that so that became really curious to him right and so he starts I might have my timelines off on this a little bit but basically so he comes back and he starts wanting to talk comes back on his second trip and he wants to talk with the grandparents but when he get he arrives to this to this area where he had originally met them he doesn't see them he instead ends up meeting Anastasia their granddaughter great granddaughter and granddaughter so same person just different relatives so anyways so he, so she's like, oh yeah, I can take you to see them. So they go on a hike into the woods, and, and you can read all about it in the first book, Anastasia, right? You're going to want to read this. This is, again, brightly required reading list stuff. It's not number one. It's number two. Number one is The Slight Edge. Number two is The Ringing Cedars books. And uh, not because of importance, but because of sequencing. It's better to read the other one first just for sequencing purposes. Now, if you feel attracted to read the Ringing Cedars first, just go for it. It's not like a hard and fast rule. Um, but if you're just kind of in doubt, go with the, go with that slight edge first. So, okay, so he meets her. Now, I'll tell you a little bit about Anastasia. So, so Anastasia, like I said, she grew up in the middle of this forest, but she didn't have all of the like commercials and uh, junk food and distractions that we all grow up with, right? And so something different happened in her growth, her, her, her growth of how she grew up. And so she's part of an ancient Vedic lineage that separated from the rest of humanity like millennia ago, like a long time ago. And where most of humanity went down this path of what you would call techno a technocratic path, where we focus on technologies, right? Hers went more of a nature-oriented path, where she focused on working with life, you know, conscious life as a means for taking care of oneself. So her grand great-grandpa and her grandpa, they did have their own way of education, but it's different than your typical way. Like, she didn't go to a school like a physical school and sit down at tables and stuff like that, right? And also, this is important, a lot of times when you go to kind of rural places, you, the people are can be a little like, no offense to them, but not very educated. Um, they have a lot of bad habits, like maybe like a lot of drinking of alcohol or smoking and stuff like that. And for that reason, they're not very proactive type people or I don't want to even want to use the word capable because they can be capable like they can have a lot of skills but there's kind of like a diminishing kind of like feeling there right so um, in this case though she grew up with perfect health and perfect everything and so I'm going to tell you how that happened so she grew up with at like with so let's say you have a dog right and the dog is like a family dog and the the dog gets to know the family and you know dogs are can be great family members right if anybody's had a dog that's been well loved they'll protect the family they'll bark when somebody um, comes to the house uh, if somebody tries messing with you like if they're a smart dog, they'll, they'll help protect you. Um, some dogs are good at playing catch and fetch, and some will even will actually even do some. You can train dogs to help be service animals and crossing roads and stuff like that, right? So, so animals, in this case dogs, can, can provide like a service, right? 
and and be like part of the family right so she grew up in nature just imagine like in the cedar forest with just the wolves the bears the birds the bees all around and and so they be, they got to know her and she got to know them from from her infancy from when she was born and So they all got to know each other and they, they became friends. Like she doesn't eat any animals or anything like that. She eats uh, just all entirely vegan, vegan food. So, <clears throat> so the wolves, so she's friends with the wolves. They help her with doing things and, and uh, end up later, later on helping her raise. It's gonna sound totally incredible, incredible to many I'm sure, but we'll get into more details of it later. But help her raise her, her children when she has some children later on in some of the later books where she has some children, two children. And uh, the bears also, she also, Anastasia actually hibernates and she'll hibernate with her, with her, with one of the bears that, that is in the area that lives with her and um, helps her keep her warm, I think also at night when she's really cold. And, um, it's just incredible because to me, what really initially spoke so deeply to me was exactly this, this harmony with nature that I've always felt in my soul. And, and that when I was a child, I just had this fast, I remember when I first planted my first garden, when I was a, when a little child, and this was like an isolated event because it happened and then I didn't continue gardening, like it just for whatever reasons, I had like one or two summers where I had like a, like these cherry tomatoes that I grew and I was so happy, so happy and so in love with them and so fascinated by this whole experience. And, and, and that was it. Like I didn't grow up on a farm or anything. It was like suburb, suburbs, you know, but I remember that. And also I remember this cherry tree and I had such a love and affinity for these for these plants and and now I know more about the significance of it because as humans were designed to oops I'm just gonna set up a little more as humans were designed to kind of interact and co-create with with the natural world but we we our lives have become so other than that which is which is one of the greatest tragedies but it's been also an incredible learning experience and we have an opportunity now to come back into harmony with all that. And so when, so Anastasia, so this guy Vladimir ends up meeting Anastasia and Anastasia asks Vladimir, she says, would you write these books about everything that you see when you're with me? Just, just write it all as it is. Don't make any extra embellishments. Don't add anything else. Just write it as it is. And at first he's like, <laughs> honey, I'm like a trader. I don't, I'm an entrepreneur, I'm not an author. Nobody would even, even if I did write these books, nobody would even read them because I suck at writing. So, like I said, I told you how like Anastasia, when she was growing up, she didn't have all of these inhibitions in her life to commercials, junk food, to, to slow down her evolution and growth. So she actually evolved very, very quickly. and far beyond what we even think is even possible. Like most people, we, we just like, it's so far beyond what most people has ever thought is possible. To many, Anastasia can seem like an enigma or a phenomena or not even a human, but she talks, says time and time again that she, no, she is human. Um, and these are all, everything she can do is all innate for being a human. And that's another part of like this interesting thing. So you have to read the books, but, so she shows Vladimir how to become a writer. <laughs> and his books have now sold millions, millions of copies around the world. <clears throat> and to me, they're the most significant books of our time, easily and by far. So one of the things, so let's just tell you a little bit about a couple of things that she shares. So Vladimir writes these books and everything he sees is just when he's with her and so Anastasia tells a lot of stories about life from the past, from the future, and in the present moments also. And she shares things about the biggest one that I want to talk about right now, just because it's related to the Brightly Earth Development Fund and my work with it, is 
uh, is this. It's that um, if every family had at least two and a half acres of their own land, they would have enough space to, to grow their own food, which gives them higher quality nutrition, which allows them to think better and take care of themselves better, which means that they're also gonna have a leverage between having a healthy impact on the world and also use the mind and the, the body to be able to do things in healthier ways that are better for people because they're more capable and nourished and also because we're not throwing a lot of trash and pesticides and whatever crap around the world through your lifestyle. Um, other, other interesting things that happen is that when children, she talks a lot about children, which is one of her favorite topics, which also happens to be one of my favorite topics, and it is that when a child gets to get be raised in this kind of like small farm kind of like an environment where they have a lot of connection with the natural world um, then some interesting things happen they you know they get to interact with the plants and the bacteria and the probiotics that can cover a person so they'll be healthier but also plants and animals are far more capable companions than, say, all the manufactured toys and educational tools that we have created. Um, this is because the, the intelligence and the, the dimensions of, of life, essentially, are far more interactive than building blocks and stuff like that. Not, not saying that those are bad, but a child could make their own building blocks if they saw that was something wanting to do with sticks, for example, and stuff like that. Um, we often are just get, and I see this with so many mothers and parents, like they're just trying to occupy their children. And a lot of it is, which is around a very practical need that the parents need some time for themselves. But there's also a lot of kind of like self-sabotaging that happens in that process because ultimately what happens is that it's just distraction after distraction after distraction and the kids get raised being very distracted and that just moves on that the kids become a further and further dis distraction to the parents until the children are just like either the constant and unending source of uh, a, a, of a parent's uh, attention or which is e that one or equally as awful it that um, the child uh, becomes n to no like doesn't capture any attention and, and they're shut away from the parents and, and neither of those are healthy or viable solutions to uh, authentically raise and nurture a full human being okay so so how do we then raise children? It, these are these are kind of like lifelong questions, and, and there's I'm not going to be able to answer these fully and just in the sit the sit down right now. But it is a topic that I do plan on revisiting and giving you more ideas to generate more curiosity for yourself. Um, and there are lots of great books and stuff like that out there, and we'll we'll get into that. But if you just read the Ring Cedars books, you'll get amazing information that will be generationally transformative so so start there um, but what I, what I what kind of want to say about this and raising children is that this is an important topic to Anastasia and it is because this is our leverage point for creating the kind of paradigm shift that is does necessary for us today in this world because ultimately our children in this world are are not we're not we haven't taken care of them which means that we haven't actually taken care of ourselves and I don't want that to sound kind of like metaphorical or uh, kind of like philosophical because that's that's not going to get us anywhere um, I know that we ha we have teachers that are committed to to public school education and, and all of that stuff um, there are great people who do a lot with with almost no support and resources out there and 
And I tip my hats off to you for going into those darkest moments of our humanity and our human history and our systems that we have created um, and shedding some light. Um, it's time for us to go way beyond that. And that's what's happening, okay? We have to go way, way, way beyond that. So on that note, Anastasia inspired uh, a school and the school is created by children. And this is really kind of the t like the tip of the iceberg for, th for this topic, but essentially the children in this school have a very fundamentally different way of learning and education. They learn a topic completely until they're fully satisfied with it. And once they have fully digested it, then they move on to the next one. So the idea is that you're following <clears throat> your train of thought and your own interest and your curiosity to the nth degree. And if somebody, and you can go and ask other people to support you in learning and, and they have kind of like their own classes that are kind of like on that, on that, that, on that line of thinking. But you're always encouraged that if you are, if somebody, if you ask, say, a peer to help you understand something and they don't answer it to your, to the level of what you're satisfied, then you should continue to keep searching until you get uh, an answer that you are satisfied with. This is a way that children, children themselves, can have and will continue to uh, push the levels of understanding beyond what has previously been at, where they have been at. If an adult tells the children, hey, this is the answer, that doesn't inspire any real creative thinking. And it might not even be true. You know, time and time again through history, we have constantly come to one so conclusion and then later on that conclusion has been proven to be maybe not the full truth, not accurate or not useful. And so we're constantly learning, right? As, as, as adults or as children or whatever, right? As humanity. And so this approach to learning is far more powerful because it leaves that openness to, hey, we can always go deeper. And when a child or a person feels that level of depth that's next, it's like, yeah, but that doesn't fully actually answer my question, they're encouraged to go deeper. And then they might, that's how new, disco new discoveries will and have and are, are happening in, in all, all fields. So the children created the school and they built, they like actually built it. They actually like designed it and had probably a little bit of help with a couple little pieces from car, some, some, arch, some architects or whatever and stuff. Ooh, it's getting hot over here. I'm gonna go sit over here. But, but basically they, um, they made it themselves. So, um, that's important, and we'll, we'll talk a lot more about all of this because this is such an important topic, and, and basically it's something that everybody's going to have to master. Uh, the art of raising children. And, again, so Anastasia, this is an important topic to Anastasia. It's an important topic to me. These books are on their brightly required reading list. And what else? I guess that's enough for right now. I'm biking, I might just have to do like a playlist all about Anastasia here and we'll, we'll cover different topics because otherwise this video is going to get way too long. Um, anyways, check it out. Let me know what you think. See how you like it. And, you know, just again, as this relates to the Brightly Earth Development Fund, it's the two and a half acres per family, and this was an idea that Anastasia first put forth. So I'm really just building the Brightly Earth Development Fund off of off of Anastasia's idea and just taking the initiative to activate it. Uh, as of right now, the Brightly Earth Development Fund is centered around buying around a thousand acres of a thousand acres at a time. 
uh, subdividing it into two and a half to five acre parcels spiraled around a town center. Uh, people have five years to demonstrate that they're taking care of it in a healthy, organic type of a way or they're out. But we'll have a committee to support people uh, to make sure people, we want people, we basically want people to be successful. But if your heart isn't in it, then it just, it's not going to work out. So, and we will have some funds to support people and ideally in financing it for themselves that won't use banking systems. And we also ideally have uh, some uh, kind of funding programs for people. For Actually, I really want to have things for, for for kind of special group people, not just people who just need a little extra like support. Um, and and we'll be, I'll be kind of identifying who those groups are, but basically like to have some kind of like scholarship programs for people. And um, so that's the Brightly Earth Development Fund. That's basically a spin-off of spin-off or actually just the specific implementation of one of, Anasta of Anastasia's proposal and uh, how it relates to children a little bit. And so anyways, that's Anastasia. That's the very, very long answer, I guess. Thank you for bearing with me on that one. It's important, I promise you. Take care, guys. Bye.